Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO, how to raise seed funding for your startup via convertible notes and safes. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm with KNL Gates LLP, and I'm excited for today's conversation. Before we get started, um, let me tell you a little bit about some things that are going on in the background. As you may have noticed, I'm actually running all of the tech in the background. So please bear with me if there are any technical glitches. Uh, it's a lot to do to both present and also run all, all the tech in the background. With that in mind, if you've got a question or a comment, I'd love to see it. Please use the Q&A function. I'll be monitoring that. Throughout today's conversation, which is going to be about an hour long with a half hour of questions on the back end, I'm going to be pausing during my presentation and answering on point uh, questions. And if we don't get to your questions during my presentation, that's okay. We'll try to get to them to the end at the end, um, you know, provided that it's going to be a, a question of general applicability. Now, a couple other notes. As you may have heard, today's presentation is being recorded. That's terrific because if you've missed some or you miss all of it, so long as you've registered, we'll be following up with an email in about a week or so with uh, a video, with a video so you can see it. Now, the sort of corollary to that is please don't provide any confidential information to me or to the rest of uh, the participants because it's going to be memorialized and potentially shared with other folks. So this is not a venue, this is a public venue. Uh, please don't share any confidential information. Let's see. And with that in mind, let's get underway. Now, Couple more notes. Uh, today's discussion is for general information purposes. This is not legal advice. It's not specific to you. We're gonna be discussing rules and exceptions to those rules. There'll be exceptions to those exceptions. And the reality of it is, is that, you know, if I answer a question that you've got and I answer that on the fly today, or even if we have a follow-up conversation a little bit later, uh, and, you know, I have office hours, which I keep, um, I'm not gonna have enough facts to, to get sufficient information to give you specific legal advice. So uh, also in line with that, don't give me any confidential information. Um, and you're not a client unless and until we've gone through the conflicts process and uh, we've got a written engagement agreement in place. That said, I think today's conversation is gonna be immensely helpful for those of you who are interested in raising venture capital. Now, let me tell you uh, a little bit of the overview. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, uh, what my practice is, why I'm speaking with you today. Then we'll move into really the, the meat of today's conversation, which is structural considerations for uh, venture-backed companies, um, the trajectory of what it takes to, to sort of start a company, raise initial capital, and then raise subsequent venture rounds. We'll talk about considerations when you're pitching investors. And I think already in the Q&A function, the question and answer function, I see some questions about that. So we'll, we'll hit on that today. I think that's gonna be pretty interesting for you all. We'll talk about what the financing options are, all right? So, and today, again, we're focused on safes. We're focused on convertible notes. So that's what we'll be drilling into. We'll be talking about key terms and considerations within this, those convertible securities. Um, we'll talk, I've already seen, already seen some questions about, um, about caps and other things. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll go over valuation and dilution, kind of what that means and where that fits in with safes and convertible notes. We'll talk about some common pitfalls and then we'll get to Q and A afterwards. So again, today's, I think today's discussion is going to be very exciting. If you've got questions or comments, please use the question and answer function in in Zoom. Uh, the chat is for you, the audience members, to kind of have a conversation and a caucus, a caucus amongst yourselves. Now, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. So I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney. I've been practicing since 2005. I'm based in San Francisco, but I work with companies that are all over the world. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm with KNL Gates LLP, which is a fully integrated, full service global law firm. We've got, I believe, over 40 offices with over 1,900 attorneys on five different continents. We've got a rich history in venture and venture capital. And um, 
It's one of the reasons why I'm very excited to be here. This is actually my inaugural webinar. Um, I was at another firm, which is a very good firm before, um, but I'm delighted to be here. And I love working with entrepreneurs, you know, on their financings as their outside counsel and, and helping them exit. And, you know, I consider myself as having a bit of an entrepreneurial bend myself uh, because before I was, well, I started off working for a court, went to work for a big firm, started my own firm, grew a little boutique firm for about five or six years, and then sort of migrated back to big law practice in large measure because it's very helpful to be able to bring all the resources to bear that venture back companies need. But I do find that, you know, the experience I had in creating and starting a business from scratch uh, with no clients, which is not the way to do it, but the way I did it, um, really helps, uh, helps me bring a good perspective in working with entrepreneurs and it really resonates with them. And I think it makes me a better advisor. So let's take a moment. If you haven't filled out the audience survey, please do so now. Um, then I'm gonna share it with you. We'll go over that. In the interim, I wanna just kind of talk about who I think this uh, today's webinar is gonna be good for. So I think if, you, if you've got a company that you've started or are contemplating starting that you intend to be venture-backed, okay? And, and a venture-backed company is a sort of a pretty specific type of company. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a little bit. But if you are intending to be venture-backed, this is probably, you're gonna get the most value out of this. You know, if you are outside of, of venture, I think this is illustrative. I think you'll get some good information in terms of framework for thinking about, you know, entity choice selection, those types of things. Uh, and I also will find, I think that if you are an investor, let's say an angel investor, or you're maybe a micro VC, or you're in the corporate VC side, this conversation will also probably be very helpful for you. So that's who it's really sort of geared towards. Now, let's find out who's in the room. And I'm going to share the results. And we got a great response rate today. We got 80, 87, 82% of the folks responding. So we've got about a quarter of the people in the Bay Area, which is great. We've got another 7% elsewhere in California and 35% elsewhere in the US with 10% elsewhere in North America, a couple of folks from South America, some folks from Europe, some folks from Asia, uh, and then some folks in... Africa and, and Australia. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, today's conversation is recorded. So we actually have a lot of, I've been doing these now for a while, you know, since the pandemic began. And what we find is um, there's a, a large contingent of folks who show up in person. There's also an even larger contingent, you know, for time zone differences and other reasons can't make it live, but they can watch the recording. And so, you know, if you haven't made it live, that's okay. I'm really happy to have you here too. And you'll get the, uh, the video, if you've registered, you'll get the video in about a, a week or so. Uh, bear with us as it's the holidays. And as I also mentioned, this is the, the first, uh, first one as I moved over and changed firms. So let's kind of jump into the meat of things. And I'm gonna close this window and move this box up here. Oh, so much more space on my desktop. All right, so a moment ago, I was just talking about venture back companies being sort of a very specific thing. Um, and they have a very specific kind of structure that is very common to see. And we typically will see them ending up with a Delaware C Corp. Now, I'm going to explain sort of the matrix as to what, you know, the matrix that we apply as and why we usually end up in a Delaware C Corp. Um, but before I do, I want to kind of unpack a little bit about why I said this sort of specific thing. So they have a, a very typical path. So these types of companies are either sort of developing or commercializing more likely um, a technology that, that is market disruptive, or they're able to kind of go in and capture a tremendous amount of market share. And what they need to do this really is to be able to grow and scale quickly, which means they need quite a lot of capital or dollars invested. And we'll talk a little bit more about this actually in a minute when we talk about pitching investors and sort of knowing your audience. But you know, typically they're gonna look to grow, you know, the model is 
grow and scale and exit in seven to kind of no more than 10 years or so. Now, in terms of the matrix, which I just sort of mentioned, uh, what we look at, the framework that we look at are a few different things, okay? So we, we, you know, whether it's these types of companies or any type of company, we always kind of take a look at the, the few types of things. We take a look at sort of the tax impact or tax, you know, what the impact of the structure is going to be on taxes and tax liability. Whether or not uh, those owners and other folks are, want to have exposure to personal liability. We think about the consequences of the ownership structure and whether or not there's going to be any equity incentives that need to be given or granted. Um, we think about capital raising requirements. What is it that your investors are going to want, right? So how much of capital do you need to raise? From whom will you raise it? And what will those investors be expecting to see? We think about sort of the management requirements or management structure that's going to be required as this company grows and scale, scales. We think about how you're going to exit. And we also think about your business, right? And what the regulatory framework is for the line of business that you're going into, right? So certain kinds of businesses are highly regulated, right? Whether that's in healthcare or fintech or other things. And so sometimes that will push things one way or another. Now, what we typically see for venture-backed companies is this means that a Delaware C Corp, you know, is going to be the right answer for most of them. Uh, Delaware, because, uh, because of the robust Delaware general corporate law that we have, okay, so the, the corporate law that's in Delaware, um, the liability protection for the directors and officers is generally considered to be better in Delaware than elsewhere. So that's, that's kind of a big thing insofar as those venture investors typically will want to have one or more uh, folks on the board of the company. So liability protection for their appointees or designees is, is important. The Delaware Chancery is a, a very sophisticated court that is handled a lot of business disputes so, and corporate disputes. So one of the things in here is that uncertainty uh, makes it difficult to make good business decisions, right? So the thought process is, you know, many very sophisticated business issues and disputes get litigated in Delaware in the Chancery with a sophisticated, um, you know, set of, of judges. And so those, those decisions are going to be, you know, appropriate and not only that, it's sort of if you've had one, if you've had a dispute or an issue, it's likely someone else has had it. And so maybe you can get some certainty. And then lastly, the Delaware Secretary of State's office is a very professionally run organization. It moves uh, corporate paperwork through pretty expeditiously. And you know that's really helpful for financings and exits and other things along those lines. Now, why a C-Corp? Uh, well, we typically will end up seeing a C-Corp because that's what the investors, what the venture capital investors are gonna want to see. And the reason for that is that they are pass-through entities um, and what that means is they're set up as a fund, set up typically as, you know, like a limited partnership and they need to have, they don't want the profits and losses of their portfolio companies, right? That would be like your company along with another set of companies that they've invested in getting passed through to their investors. It'd be a tax nightmare. So that's typically why we, we end up with a Delaware C Corp. Now, folks sometimes ask, well, oh my goodness, well, I've set myself up with an LLC or I've set myself up with a, a California corporation, let's say. And, you know, the answer is like, don't panic. Uh, these are things that can typically be fixed and addressed, you know, um, provided that you can get the various stakeholders to come on board with it. And, uh, but the problem is, if you can't get those, the requisite stakeholders that come on board, it can be prohibitively expensive or sometimes it just can't be fixed. So again, I wouldn't panic about that, but um, you know, my, my instinct usually is measure twice, cut once. So you know, go over the matrix with every company and make sure, yep, that's the right one for you. I'm gonna pause here because it looks like we have a few questions that have come in. And I'm gonna see if I can take them before moving on. Now, I see some questions. I want to try and answer questions that are, are focused on this topic. So if there aren't any, then uh, we'll hold them maybe until later. 
Uh, folks, somebody has asked about a benefit corporation. Is that unacceptable? The answer is no, it's not unacceptable at all. In fact, actually, I would say if you said 10 years ago, people would say, what the heck is a benefit corporation? We're not investing in that. But um, a benefit corporation is becoming more and more popular. And you know that honestly is a topic that could be its own topic, its own hour long discussion. So suffice it to say, you can have a Delaware C Corp that is also a benefit corporation. And um, you know uh, those can be investable. So you'll need to work with your counsel on that. If someone asked, is seven to 10 years the general expectation to exit? Yes, the, the answer is yes. Depends on your industry and a few other things, but yes. Is a Delaware S Corp a good stepping stone before investors come on in when you're small? You know, I do get that question from time to time and I have seen it done, but the answer is typically no, because, you know, when you change from your S election, well, there, there are, there's a bunch of tax issues that go on in there. Um, and so we'd want to bring in a tax person to consult with it. But, you know, if you got an S corp, you, you may not be eligible for qualified small business stock, which in the long term, looking at your exit may get you a better result. Um, additionally, there can be some tax consequences when you sort of get, you know, uh, have your S election revoked. Uh, plus, if you're giving equity compensation to employees, then all of a sudden they're going to end up with a K-1. So, um, you know, if someone walked in with an S-Corp, we'd look at what we might need to do to address that issue, but I wouldn't automatically go there. Sorry, I'm just clearing off some of these questions. All right, I'm going to take uh, someone asked how long does it take to set up a C Corp? Um, I mean, the actual mechanics of setting up a C Corp is not very, it doesn't take very long. The, the difficulty is just getting all the stakeholders aligned with what it is that the sort of setup is. So I, I would say, you know, kind of usually if there aren't really a lot of issues going on and it's just kind of new founders to a new project, I would say two to three weeks, um, you know, could it be done as soon as basically overnight or the day after or the day after that? Absolutely. But usually in the sort of short next day type frame, time frame, you know, it's sophisticated individuals who've already done it before and know exactly what they want. And there's no education required in terms of, you know, what the ownership interests are going to be, whether they're vesting or not vesting, that, that type of thing. And it can also take longer, right? Because you know, if folks haven't really done any planning or there's holdouts, it, it can take a while. So let's keep chugging along so we can keep getting into the meat of things here. All right, so considerations when you are going out to pitch invest investors. Well, first and foremost, you should know your audience, okay? Different investors have different objectives. So I sort of mentioned this earlier, but venture, traditional venture funds have their own investors. Those folks are called LPs, limited partners, and they you know, promise to put in money and they promise to have it committed for seven to 10 years or so. And they're also sort of, uh, you know, as I understand it, you know, there's also a promise or um, an expectation of return, right? Like, you know, you put your money in with us and, you know, we can't promise you that you're going to get this return, but, you know, we believe we will be able to achieve, you know, sort of roughly a 3x return over that period of time. And the strategy that happens, the, the sort of typical strategy is, you know, we're going to make a good number, we're going to create a portfolio, we're going to make a good number of bets into different companies that are sort of positioned for explosive growth. There are going to be many losers. There will be, you know, you know, by losers, I mean companies that, you know, don't have a good return or end up going under. There will be some companies that do okay. Uh, and then there will be a couple of really large winners. Um, and that's from those winners, that's really we're going to make the return of, of our fund. Now, that's particularly true of early stage funds. Later stage, 
you know, the company to a certain extent has already been de-risked and there's a much better sense as to, you know, what's kind of what the trajectory of the company is. But since we're talking about seed financing, we're talking about the early stage. So, you know, what, what does a winner look like? Sometimes people want to know, well, that would sort of be a company that's sort of doubling or tripling in value every 18 to 24 months or so. So, you know, if you had, you know, if a VC put in a $1 million investment sort of in the series A stage, you know, it would be worth 2 million at the B and 4 million at the C and 8 million at the D. And, you know, it might be 16 million after that. Now it could be up or down from there, but you could see how, you know, you could get a, how uh, an investor could potentially get a return on a, on a winner that is 16, 25, 30, I mean, some, some of these companies, sometimes every once in a while, there's a, a great big winner and it could be a hundred X. So that's sort of what motivates or typically motivates the, is the, the vent, the traditional venture investor. Strategic investors have different considerations. Okay. Uh, sometimes it, it is financially oriented, but many other times they're trying to do other things. Maybe they're trying to develop a, you know, the market for their own products, right? Maybe they sell chips. And so they want to help foster companies that build devices that use their chips. Um, you know, maybe they've got, maybe, maybe they want to have uh, their corporate development pipeline, right? So they want to be able to pick up who's the latest and greatest, you know, innovators coming out of space or who's got great technology. You know, there's sort of sometimes, you know, uh, it's been said that smaller companies can innovate quicker, better, faster than larger companies, especially for technology. Now, that may be true, that may not be true, but you know that is one thought that's out there, and it does motivate some some of the corporate development uh, initiatives that we see. You know, other times they want to try and maintain their market position and relevance, and you know, get the first crack at you know. Keeping, keeping other folks out. So um, they've got different strategic, those strategics have different considerations. And so it's, it's best to be very mindful of what those considerations are when you're negotiating with them and potentially doing business with them. Um, and so some, and you just wanna make sure you're aligned, right? Uh, and going in eyes wide open. Now, one of the other considerations that's very important is making sure that you uh, comply with all the securities laws that are out there. So the securities laws are designed basically for consumer protection. It's, you know, so that folks can't just make up a sham company and go out and raise money by selling securities. And people say, well, I've got a small company. Do they even apply to me? And the answer is yes. But compliance means, you know, making sure that you have identified exemptions from them and targeting those exemptions, right? So, Many times those and exemptions will involve only raising from accredited investors, right? Those are investors that make 200,000 or 300,000 if they're married filing jointly in a year or have a million dollars in investable assets. Um, you know, it's one aspect, making sure that what you're raising, uh, you know, you're not, not doing a public solicitation. So you're, you know, staying within your network and you've got a substantial pre-existing relationship with these folks. Uh, working through that's important. I guess the one other, if I could just jump back and talk a little bit about knowing your audience, you know, another sort of bucket of investors, not bucket, but another group of investors would be angel investors, right? These are individuals who sort of fall potentially into that, well, individuals who fall into that accredited investor category and or groups of them. Um, and they've got their own sets of, of motivations. Maybe they have had an exit in this particular space and they wanna, you know, maybe they're a former founder or an early employee and they wanna help seed the next great wave that comes through. Um, or maybe they just like the technology or, or maybe they are uh, sort of motivated by sort of the mission of the company, especially as we think about the environmental and social and governance, the ESG companies. Um, that we see coming out, which are very exciting and I love working with. Uh, so again, always crucial 
to know your audience. Now, I'm gonna go jump into, actually, let me take a couple questions real quick. Let me see if I can knock through some of these. There's a question about what city should I go to to find my seed stage investors? Uh, question about whether or not, is there a site you can go to? Um, I wanna answer probably both of those. I'm just trying to see if there are any other questions in the same, que the same category. So one of the nice things about being here in 2021, almost 2022, is there's a lot of information available online on the internet. There's Crunchbase, there's PitchBook, there's TechCrunch, there's all kinds of uh, resources out there for you to, you know, and there's LinkedIn, right? For you to identify investors, whether they're seed stage or later stage investors, um, and figure out if you've got a connection to them, you know, and, and maybe to prime that connection. And so, um, you know, I always say that when you're raising capital, you're selling a part of the company. It may not necessarily feel like it, um, especially if you're raising on a safe or a convertible note. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. But, you know, you got to run a good, incredible sales process. And part of that is figuring out, you know, who's in your network that you think would be interested in, in making this investment. So there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, as I mentioned, in, in no particular order, tech crunch, crunch base, pitch book, your LinkedIn, groups of angels like the Koretsu Forum and various other angel networks. Um, you know, they may or may not be the right fit for you and your company, but they're out there and uh, they're on the internet. And, you know, in terms of the pandemic, it, it has made them in general kind of more accessible, maybe not physically accessible, but everybody's doing business online these days and virtually. All right, let's like, all of that was critical information to set the stage to talk about kind of what you need to have in place in order to get set up and do sort of bridge raise, right? So what your financing options are here is usually convertible debt or convertible equity. Convertible equity has been popularized by Y Combinator um, and they call it the safe. Convertible debt has been around for quite a bit longer, um, but there's no real standard on convertible debt. And with respect to safes, in one sense, Y Combinator puts out a form of safe, but in another sense, almost everybody makes at the very least a few tweaks and changes to those safes. So we'll talk more about that later and maybe you'll have some questions about it. But if we're talking about the sort of seed stage especially kind of out here in, in the Bay Area, in the Valley, you know, we're talking about raising a million, two million, maybe three million in one round, or, or maybe even more than that in a, in a number of successive rounds. That's typically what we'll see. Now, I do work, uh, you know, I have worked on deals across the country and internationally, that varies. But even still, you know, it would be uncommon to do a venture round for less than a million dollars because the expense sort of associated with that is, um, you know, uh, it's kind of too great. So, you know, typically we're going to end up doing a convertible note or safe, and we're going to talk about those today. And that's the focus of today's conversation. Now, in, the, in its essence for convertible securities, we're really talking about the ability is issuing a security that is has the ability to convert into equity in the future and to incentivize folks to put their money in now, um, you know, without evaluation, and we'll talk about caps in a moment, but without evaluation, um, what you're gonna, what there's gonna be is there's gonna be a discount mechanism, right? And that discount mechanism is either a percentage and we'll show this later with some math, 
you know, don't be deterred by the math. Or we're talking about a cap or both. Sometimes we use both. Uh, but the thought process here for these convertible notes and safes are a few fold. One is an early stage company. It needs time and money to build out its initial team, its initial, you know, prototype product, maybe even some initial tests in the market to see if there's going to be some market traction. Let's not spend a whole lot of time and money at law with lawyers. Now, that's not to say these things are free or that you should just do them yourself because we'll talk about some of the pitfalls that happen with them. But I will tell you they're orders of magnitude less than what a, a venture round is going to be in terms of cost. Now, the other really important thing with these um, instruments is that you know, if you're using a discount or you're using a cap, you know, you are delaying or you're avoiding actually concretely valuing the company at the point of the sale of that security. Now, what that means for the founder is, you know, far less worry about, you know, selling too much of the company for too little money. And what that means for the investor is far less of a worry of, you know, paying too much for too little of the company. And we'll also talk about some other sort of ancillary bonuses or not ancillary bonuses, but ancillary benefits to, to using these structures. But let's talk about what, what terms are generally in there. So on here, if you see an asterisk, we're talking about convertible notes. If you don't see an asterisk, we're talking about things that apply to both convertible notes and also to safes. So what we typically see for a convertible note is a maturity date. So that's the date that it needs to get paid back. A note is a form of debt and it comes due at some point in time. And we'll talk about some of the pluses and minuses of having convertible notes at that point. Convertible notes also have interest rates. So there's interest that's gonna be accruing, which to a certain extent almost kind of acts as like a discount um, insofar as the investor's not putting in more money and yet you know, they're going to get a greater number of shares once that, say, once that convertible note converts. So I think it's important to keep in mind <clears throat> when you're doing a convertible note and uh, versus a safe, you know, is the interest rate. Now, both safes and convertible notes are going to have a number of conversion terms, and we're going to unpack those and we'll unpack some of these other terms in a little bit. And then those instruments also are going to have terms that govern any amendment or change to this instrument. And you, you may say, well, wait a second, like, why is that? What is that? Well, what it is, is it's a mechanism to get some of the terms of the instrument to change if you need it. And so under what circumstances does that happen? So for example, if you've got a convertible note that comes up against its maturity date, you know, you don't want to be in a position to have to pay it back yet because the company doesn't have the cash to pay it back. You know, typically we'll see the sort of a term that would allow the holders of majority of interest to band together to get all of the notes, even if those folks didn't agree to the amendment, all of the notes to change the maturity date. And other times we see this if, you know, uh, I don't know, sometimes if there's a discount rate that's too high or there's a cap that's too low, or there's some sort of other term that, you know, is going to deter future investment by another investor. That, that new investor may say, well, you know what, I'm not going to put in my $5 million if I know that it's going to, you know, if I know X, Y, or Z is going to happen. If I know that, you know, half of it, you know, there's some term in the convert, if there were to be some term in a convertible note that, you know, they had to get half of their money back and the remainder converted over or something. There needs to be, a mem there needs to be an amendment mechanism to fix those things. Uh, you know, the remaining terms, not quite as common to negotiate, but, you know, there are other things that sometimes come in there that we, we have to deal with. So sometimes um, investors wanna see a personal guarantee at least if we're talking about companies that are venture backed or aspire to be venture backed, especially if we're talking about sort of the Bay Area or most of the US or pretty much any of the other, even outside the US, the deals I've done, we've always 
been able to, yeah, I can't think of a time when I haven't been able to push back on the personal guarantee and get that taken out. Um, you know, the point of these instruments is to be basically a placeholder to get that preferred stock or equity later, you know, um, and it's, these are all highly risky. So you need to make sure you're getting an investment from investors who are fully prepared to, you know, bear the risk of a full loss of their investment. So personal guarantees usually get pulled out of there. Sometimes folks want to have the note be secured, you know, or have a security interest in certain, you know, in the company's assets or maybe specific assets. Um, that is not, I, I've not seen that, or we've been able to push back, you know, sort of it's just a typical round of financing. Uh, under certain very limited circumstances, very, very rarely, you know, we will see some security interest in there, but, you know, typically we can get that push back on. Uh, those are two things that kind of come, come up and are pretty popular. Um, let's talk about some of these terms. So we're talking about convertible notes now because we got that little asterisk. You know, typically we see 18 to 24 months. But what you really should be thinking about doing, um, and I actually am going to take a second to zoom, I think, all the way back because I think it's going to be helpful. And maybe in the future, actually, I will put this image again here. Um, but I mean, what you really need to be doing is thinking about where you are in your company's financing life cycle. And think about, you know, how much money do you need and how much time will it take to get to the next financing raise, right? So on this diagram, you know, in the sort of angel, C capital, friends, family, and tongue in cheek, fools stage, um, you know, are you going to be doing, do you just need one convertible round or do you need multiple? And making sure that you've got enough time you know, in your business plan so that, and you raise enough capital so you can get to that first venture round, right? At which point all these notes and stuff will convert over. So, you know, 18 to 24 months is kind of a, a, a rule of thumb, but again, really what you should be focused on is what's the business plan? What's the capital raising plan? Am I getting enough time to get that done? Out here in California, we've got the California financing uh, law, which applies to to persons engaged in a business of a finance lender or broker, you know, that kind of basically kind of falls more on the investor side, but it's something that, um, you know, companies should pay attention to. And certainly investor, if you're listening to this, pay attention to. Interest rate, um, it can be as low as the applied federal rate. And otherwise there's gonna be interest or tax, uh, excuse me, there's gonna be imputed interest which is the amount of tax, uh, the amount of interest the IRS applies and then taxes you on. And then you gotta make sure you're not triggering any usury laws. Um, you know, California, there's 10% or there is also a, um, another formula that you apply, but interest rates have been pretty low for a while. So I don't think that formula has been applying, but I mean, typically six, 8%, yeah, I'd say five to seven percent is kind of what I've, I've been seeing recently on this. Let's talk about conversion terms. And let me just see kind of what's coming up. All right. Let's talk about conversion terms. So again, sort of the typical goal of these instruments is to avoid having to value the company now because it's too uncertain to value, right? You know, the initial team may not be together or they're just together. The initial product may not be together or, or maybe it's just together. Probably don't really have any significant customers at this point and just beginning to maybe start to sell some product or some software. So all that makes it exceedingly risky to try and value the company at this point. So kick the can down the road and have them convert into preferred stock once you kind of know what the, once you have a better sense for what the value of the company is going to be. And to reward those early investors, they're going to get a discount. Okay. And we're going to talk first about 
this concept of mandatory conversion at a discount in the next qualified financing. So mandatory conversion means it has to change from being a convertible note to being preferred stock, you know, at the next qualified financing, which is typically at least, a, you know, it sort of depends. Sometimes it's 500,000, sometimes it's 5 million. It sort of depends on where the company is, how much it's raised, what its business plan is. But it's pretty common to see a million or 2 million um, of equity financing, but sometimes that's even limited to just preferred equity financing. And a discount is a number, right? So what happens, and we'll talk about the mechanics and we'll run through the math in a little bit, but you know, whatever the price the preferred is gonna pay, you apply 25% discount. So, or 20, 25, whatever it is that um, you negotiate. So if the preferred is paying a buck a share, you know, the convertible note or safe gets converted at 75 cents a share. Again, we're gonna do the math in a minute on that. So bear with me. And then the conversion cap, you know, that is a mechanism where, you know, if the company is growing and scaling, right? And the price, you know, if the, the venture investor comes in and says, wow, you guys have done a great job. You know, your the valuation of your company, the pre-money valuation of your company is, you know, $50 million. If you've got a conversion price cap, you ignore that $50 million and you go with whatever the number of the perversion, the conversion price cap is. So if that's 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, that's the number you go with. Now that also sometimes gets triggered or used if there's a, a sale, if there's a change in control in the company, if the company gets sold, or if there's also sometimes we build in a conversion mechanism and maybe we'll, we'll use the conversion cap if, uh, if you hit the maturity date or something along those lines. I'm gonna pause here because we got a lot of questions. I'm gonna see if um, I can answer, okay. All right, I'm gonna save these questions to the end and we're gonna keep, yeah, we're gonna keep chugging along. These are great questions. Thank you for staying engaged. Hang in there. Uh, we got, well, I'll speak probably for about 15 or 20 more minutes because we got started about five minutes um, late today. And then um, we'll take questions for about 25 minutes or so. So structure, convertible notes used to always be like two documents. There used to be a note purchase agreement and there used to be a separate note. In the last five to seven years, you know, seven years ago, they started to get integrated into sort of one document. That's pretty common now. Um, although sometimes we do see a separate purchase agreement for the note. Uh, and safes, again, you know, typically based on the Y Combinator form. So in some in choosing for this, you know, and then we're gonna pivot into some of the math and I'm gonna unpack some of these things. I'm gonna answer some of the definitions that you're asking about here. Um, for seed financings, raising a couple million or maybe raising a couple rounds of a couple million, we, we typically will see some sort of convertible security used to save a convertible note. The reason is they're just less expensive to negotiate and to paper. Big bonus is, or big driving factor is that there's no valuation of the company. Um, so that has twofold, you know, I mentioned before the sort of big issue here is avoiding valuing the company so you don't sell too much of the company for too little, or the investor doesn't buy too little of the company for too much. Additionally, um, most of these companies intend to, you know, award equity grants to employees. And so, again, you know, if the company has been valued by a third party at an arm's length negotiation, you know, you're probably going to set a, take a, a stronger position with the value of the company is. So this may allow there to be sort of a lower price or everyone to feel more comfortable having a lower valuation when you're talking about the exercise price of options. <clears throat> uh, still always have to get a 409A valuation. And I know people are going to say, what the heck is that? And we'll talk about that if it comes up in the questions afterwards. But um, you got to get a 409A valuation if you're issuing options here in the U.S. Is what I Downside, um, 
especially for convertible note is it's debt. And so it can become due. And if it becomes due and you can't pay it, it can force your company into bankruptcy. Uh, additional issue is, um, especially for convertible notes, this it's considered an extra liquidation preference. So if your company winds up, right? Um, that is, let's say your company gets sold or uh, it goes into bankruptcy, it actually will, you know, the convertible note holders will get paid out before the equity owners, right? And the equity owners would be your safe holders, your uh, common stockholders or your preferred stockholders. And so, you know, it's unusual to see convertible note done or it's unusual, it would be pretty unusual to see a convertible note survive a preferred stock financing because the preferred, when the new investor is not gonna wanna sit behind that convertible note holder in this preference stack. And it's also unusual to see companies taking on convertible notes after they've raised venture capital financing. There is an exception to that sometimes they need a bridge loan to get between rounds. Um, and that's outside the scope of today's conversation. So let me try and, so we've talked about kind of the structure of the company that you need to have, um, you know, to kind of make this eligible. We've talked about the attributes of convertible notes and we talked about in the attributes of safes. Let's run through some of the mechanics on this. Um, so, but let's first talk about some definitions. So you heard me use the term pre-money valuation. The, each of these definitions, you know, in working with lawyers and business folks, you know, and negotiating these things, there's a general sense as to what the definition means or what it, people mean when they say it, but you always got to read the fine print on this stuff. But taking it a high level, general, general definition is it's the value of the company immediately before the next round of investment that comes in. And we'll, we'll take an example on that in a second. Post money is the value of the company immediately after that round of financing closes, okay? And fully diluted basis, when we talk about that, we're talking about all shares of common stock that are issued and outstanding, plus basically anything that can be converted or changed into common stock. And we also typically will include shares in the option pool, right? So if you got common stock that you issued the founders, you count that or issued other employers, you'd count that, or employees, you'd count that. You would also count the option pool that you reserved, or maybe even that you had to increase in order to get your venture round done. And you would also include the conversion of the convertible notes or the safes. And if you had any warrants or other options out there, you know, you would count each one of those. What you will not typically count is just the authorized shares. So many times when we set up a company, we will authorize 10 million shares or we will authorize 20 million shares. But that is just the number, the maximum number of shares that you can issue. It's not what's counted in the fully diluted basis. We only count, you know, what's been issued, you know, what's been promised to be issued and, you know, what's been put out there that can get changed into a common stock. Yeah. So let's run through a very simple example where we have also simplified math here. So, you know, I thought there's another presentation that I do from time to time, and I'm sure I will do it, you know, in the next half of the year. Um, and I bring in a CFO, who, an outside consulting CFO who's great. And we run through cap tables and pro forma tables. And it, it really excites me to talk about this stuff. Um, but that's not today's presentation. So we're not doing the full-blown math analysis where you can kind of dig into the Excel sheet. We're doing the, oh, okay, I can see how this happens type math with a bunch of simplifications. Okay, so very simple example. We're not factoring in the option pool or any other equity grants. You know, if a VC were to come to you and say, you know, you've got a pre-money valuation of $10 million. And in the meantime, actually you've issued 10 million of shares among the founders, okay? The price per share would be a, roughly a, a dollar a share that that VC would end up paying. So you just take $10 million and divide by the number of uh, fully diluted shares outstanding, 10 million bucks. And each founder is gonna have roughly a third of the company. So if that VC were to say, yeah, 
$10 million pre-money valuation, I'm going to put in $3 million. So that means they're going to pay a dollar a share for their shares of preferred. They're going to put in $3 million and the post money is going to be 13 million. So you just take that $10 million and you uh, add that 3 million to it. Pretty simple. Now you can see at the end of this, actually the, you know, any of the, the, the founders still have each of their 3,333,333 shares, but another 3 million shares have been issued. And so actually their percentage ownership has gone from a third to 25%. And if we continue on with this simple example, and now we start to layer in convertible notes or safes, just using the sort of dollar per share basis, at least in this first bullet point, let's unpack this. So if there had been a convertible note that was outstanding for $450,000 and it had, well, let's call it a safe, right? So we don't have to worry about the interest that accrued. So let's just say we're a safe and it had a 25% discount. Oh no, I have a, I had to change these around. So I, um, I kind of messed up on the math here, I think, or at least in that first part. Uh, so if they had a $450,000 convertible note with a 25% discount, basically what would happen is that $450,000 would convert into shares at 75 cents a share instead of, um, um, turn my phone off so I don't have a calculator, instead of a, dollar a share, like what the preferred is paying. And so in essence, they're gonna end up, I think the answer, I think that 600,000 is correct. Although that 500,000 in the next line is not correct. I should have put 450,000. Um, they're gonna end up with like 600,000 shares of shadow series. So what's what does shadow series mean? Let me just see 400,000. Yeah, that's right, 600,000 shares. Um, well, shadow series just means that it's got all the attributes of the other of the of what the preferred is getting, right? With that preferred that venture investor is getting, but it's going to have a different liquidation preference. It's going to have a different um, dividend rate to account for the fact that they only paid seventy five cents a share instead of a buck a share. So I wouldn't get hung up on that at this point, but it's they're not going to get the exact same shares that the VC is going to get. Sometimes we see that, but. 95% of the deals, we see them getting a shadow series. Now, I will also note that this is meant to just show how a discount works when we're talking about the discount really gets applied to whatever the, the VC is paying, okay? If you are a math nerd or an Excel nerd, which in some senses I've become in the last few years, um, although I'm not as great at building the formulas, I do like doing the math because it's sort of the one thing in this game that you can do and kind of get right, although there's still some art involved. You will notice that, uh, well, if we're talking about fully diluted basis, as I did a moment ago, the price per share that the VC is gonna pay is also gonna be dependent on how many shares, how many shadow series get get uh, issued. And so there's a little bit of circularness in there. Um, and, you know, to get through that, we'll use the iterative calculations on an Excel sheet. But again, that's not today's presentation. What I want you to take away from this is when we're talking about a discount, we're talking about the VC figuring out what's the price per share they're going to pay. And then you apply that discount to that price per share. And then you, you know, divide whatever's outstanding on that convertible security by that, that discounted uh, price. Moving on to the next bullet point. Uh, moving on to the next bullet point. Again, if there had been a $450,000 convertible security out there and there had been a $5 million cap, we'd see actually that the, the security holder, that convertible security holder is going to get 900,000 shares. So how does that work? Well, again, earlier I told you, you know, when we've got, when we've got these valuation caps, you know, and the pre-money valuation exceeds, uh, greatly exceeds the, the, the valuation cap, we ignore, we ignore the pre-money valuation and we actually go with what the, pre, what the valuation cap is. So here it's a $5 million cap. That gets divided by the fully diluted basis of 10 million shares. And that's what gets you the, the price per share. So it's 50 cents a share. And as a result of that, 
If you divide 450,000 shares by 50 cents a share, you'll see they'll convert over into 900,000 shares. I was gonna tell you something else. Now, that's right. Now it gets tricky if you've got a note that's got a valuation or you know, you got a convertible security that's got a discount and a cap, because then you have to figure out whether, you know, do they get a better deal? Do they get more shares, a greater number of shares with the discount, or do they get a greater number of shares with the cap? Lots of people think, oh, as soon as we hit that pre-money valuation, you know, hits the cap number. Uh, the cap's the way to go. The answer is actually no. Um, you know, you, you basically need to sort of, I think this always works. You divide the cap by the discount number and that's basically the tipping threshold. But again, the point here is not to kind of get really deeply into the nuances. It's to take away the fact that if you're using a cap, you take the cap and you divide it by the, pre, by the fully diluted basis and that's the price per share, which it'll change over. And again, you got to read the fine print on all of these things, you know, as in terms of what's getting counted in the fully diluted basis and not. Um, but that that should give you a good overview of things. All right, so we are basically done. I was going to go into common pitfalls. So before, yeah. So let me just kind of hit on these, and then we'll move over to the Q and A. Thank you for all those folks who are still here. Um, Again, compliance with securities laws, we've talked about that. So again, I've talked about having to target exemptions. One, one pitfall that is a, a big one that even experienced entrepreneurs fall into is this issue you know, here in the US is the issue of finders. That is people who say, sign up with me, give me a cut of the deal and I'll find you some money. Well, uh, that's generally impermissible, you know, unless they are an investment banker or a registered broker dealer. Uh, there are some exceptions, but most of the time, those types of people, or not those types of people, those people are not, um, may not be astute and up to it. And one of the issues with it is, you know, you blow a securities law exemption, or you, you, you know, you blow your securities laws, including the issue of finders, and you know, your, your investors could end up with a right of rescission. That is, your company would need to give the money back. And if you don't have the money and the, and the company hasn't increased in value at this point, that can sink, can end your company. Now, obviously, you don't, if you blow the securities laws because you're a fraudster, you got other issues and you may end up in jail. But um, that's not the most common pitfall. I mean, most of it is sort of inadvertent, not paying attention to the details and, uh, ending up in a company that is sunk because it's either uninvestable or they got to give the money back and you don't have the money to get back. Another real common pitfall is just thinking that there are standard terms for all of these deals. I will say there's a standard continuum of terms and what's we, what we would say is market, but there's no absolute standard. So, um, you know, don't fall for that trap. And that's true even with the safes, those do get tweaked. Um, finders again, because it's it's just such a big pitfall uh, that folks run into. Side letters. Side letters are agreements that are outside of the convertible note or the safe to do things or get things like information rights, right? So that the investor can get more information on the company uh, or maybe a board observer right, the right to sort of sit in on the board meetings or pro rata rights, that is the right to buy in uh, and buy additional shares or securities in the future. Uh, they're becoming more and more popular. I think many reasons for that are as companies are able to raise more capital based on these safes and convertible notes. Uh, and as you know, larger investors and players are kind of moving up in the food chain to, to make these earlier stage investments to secure the ability to make investments later on. Um, and there's a movement away from, from doing a, a traditional venture, you know, preferred stock issuance rounds at these early stage companies. That sort of confluence of factors means that investors are trying to secure some of these rights, which I've talked about. So I think, so there are many more asks for them. They can really run up a, a really large bill for you if you're negotiating all of these. 
And not only that, they can make it difficult in the future to secure additional financing, especially venture financing. Um, so they, they can be and should be used in the appropriate business context, but you know, it's usually not every, every investor gets a side letter or else you're gonna be running yourself ragged. Um, and the another super common pitfall is, you know, companies think, well, I can get these forms on Y Combinator. I'll just do this myself. Uh, so they fail to, you know, follow por cor the proper corporate authorization to obtain that to do these. So uh, that can lead to a lot of cleanup and a lot of expense later on and potentially render your company uninvestable. So that is basically it in a nutshell. I'm going to skip over the next slide, which is just talking more about securities laws, uh, which I don't think you need to necessarily know about. And we'll move to the Q&A function. But before we do, I'm gonna take a quick drink. Wow, we've got some great questions. I'm gonna try and get through as many as I can in the next 25 minutes or so. If I, and I'm gonna focus on, you know, questions that are going to apply to, I think, everybody in the group. Uh, and if you've got another question, I don't get to it. Uh, please feel free to email me at jason.gordon at pulsonella, excuse me, jason.gordon at knlgates.com. And uh, let me just see here. Let me change my name so that you can let me change my name and put my email in there. And I usually use my full name actually, because there are a number of other Jason Gordons. Again, if you email me, please do not send me any confidential information. It will not be treated as such. I do keep office hours. Happy to talk to you, you know, for 20 minutes or so, uh, see if I can, you know, provide you with additional general information or connect you to somebody if I, if I can. That's not a connection to capital. Um, you know, I only do that if I think there's a fit and usually if I've been working with a company for a while. All right. How to set a cap when raising a safe. So there are two different kinds, well, there are three different kinds of safes. There's safes with discounts, safes with caps, and safes with caps and discounts. Um, you know, if your company side, you typically want to focus on the, especially if you're using a safe with a cap and a discount, you're typically going to want to be making the argument that, look, uh, the cap is really there to provide an extra discount. If it turns out that your money was more valuable than we thought, and we were able to really grow this company significantly, um, so that it's way up beyond what, uh, what we would anticipate the value of it being when we did a preferred financing. And the reason for that is that, you know, the cap, again, um, ignores what the pre-money valuation is at the time of financing and pretends that it is whatever it is, whatever the cap is. And as a result, you know, without that cap, and if that pre-money valuation is really high, those investors are going to get more diluted than if they had the cap. Uh, as a founder, you, you know, if you're a founder, you need to be cognizant of the fact that that also means that that extra, you know, ownership percentage is going to basically be coming out of your, your percentage and or anybody else like other early employees on the cap table. So if you're, you know, using a safe with a cap and a discount or a convertible note with a cap and a discount in your company side, you know, usually want to sort of rely on the discount as being the mechanism to give them to, to make sure that they're appropriately rewarded with the ability of the cap to basically mean that um, they're not going to get blown out of the water if you're able to take their company, their capital and just scale hugely. If your investor side, you know, I think that story flies and, and works if you got a, a cap and a discount um, or maybe you meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, if you're cap only, then, you know, the sort of tussle that happens in different investors and different companies have different philosophies, but, you know, some take the position, well, you've got a cap only, we're going to basically try and value the company now. I, I kind of think that that's a little bit, um, 
dangerous, right? Because again, it's hard to value these really early stage companies, especially before the team's sort of fully baked, the, the product is fully baked and they've kind of gone into the market. Um, I think it kind of gets away from the ethos of what these um, instruments are supposed to do. So now that's the philosophical side. The, you know, sort of one of the other more practical sides is, you know, just knowing what the market is. So, you know, uh seen anywhere from three to five to 15 million dollar caps and just kind of knowing like what space you're in kind of where you are in the development of your company whether you've raised already that's that's what we take a look at to sort of figure out what the right and appropriate cap is and you know if you work with uh an attorney who's emerging growth and venture capital attorney he or she you know that attorney is going to have a sense for what the market is and help you, I think, you know, obviously ultimately it's a business call, but they should be able to give you some, some market data on that. Uh, is it difficult to convert from a C corp to an LLC or the other way around? You know, if the company is super duper early, it's, it can be pretty easy. If it's not early, it can be much more difficult and, and maybe not maybe not possible. Um, in terms of getting the deck or this presentation, I will circulate a video of this, which will have the deck obviously embedded in the video. Um, so that will be, um, yeah, give, give us about a week or so, especially with the holiday, there might be a little bit of a lag. <clears throat> Accelerators and incubators, man, there's been a lot of activity over the last couple of years in this space. In general, I think that they, you know, it depends. In general, it depends. <laughs> Sort of depends if they've got a track record. I think that that's important. Um, you know, there, it's about education, feedback, and then also you know access to advisors, access to potential investors in their in their network, access to um, other potential players, whether they are uh, customers. So, you know, that's important. And potentially, if, if those things align, then it, it can make sense to go into an incubator accelerator. Uh, if one is fortunate enough to have both options, would you recommend going to angels or institutional seed investors? <clears throat> uh, would need to know more facts on that one. And, and, I, and I, I punt because ideally the, the investors you want, whether they're angels or VCs, is you want, you want smart money. You want investors who know the mark. You want smart, comma, patient investors. You want investors who know the space, who have relationships, Again, maybe it's with vendors, maybe it's with other potential customers, maybe it's with other potential investors <coughs> who knows who know what it takes to build a, a business in your space. Um, and so it's too high a level question to sort of answer of angels versus institutional investors. It's going to depend on them. And so, you know, whether it's angels or institutional investors, you want to do your diligence on them. I mentioned before, you can find out, you know, Crunchbase, TechCrunch, uh, PitchBook, uh, you name it, you, you know, you can go on their websites and find out what deals they've been doing. And, you know, um, potentially, especially if they're going to be asking for a board seat or an observer seat or have a lot of sway, you want to do your diligence on them and find out where their successes have been and where their companies haven't, their portfolio companies haven't done well, whether it's an angel or a VC, like, How's that gotten worked through? Can you talk to them? Uh, now, granted, you know, you're not gonna have the time, it's not gonna be an efficient enough process to, to do that for every, every single investor. But, um, you know, in particular, if, if they're gonna be pretty hands-on or you anticipate them being hands-on, you, you wanna make sure that, that is, uh, they're aligned. Uh, again, sort of co common discounts, I would say for, for safes or convertible notes, a 
20, 25% or so. I've seen it above and below. And, and don't forget, especially with a convertible note, uh, you're going to have an interest rate. So, you know, uh, let's say a 9% interest rate, if it were to be that high, is going to have, you know, a convertible note with a 20% discount, but 9% interest rate and, you know, is outstanding for three years, probably is going to turn into more equity than a convertible note with a 25% discount and a 1% interest rate held for the same period of time. So got to model the pro formas. Again, not to the topic of today's conversation, but if there's one thing I'm going to be known for, probably written on my tombstone, hopefully that's not for quite some time. It's run the pro forma, run the pro forma, run the pro forma for this round and the next round. <laughs> Uh, so we got a question. I mentioned this earlier. Valuation issues, stock options, you know, four and nine a. There's a question, or somebody's mentioning uh, eighty three b elections. Eighty three b elections are elections that you file with the IRS when you issue stock or you you know somebody receives property. Um, that has a substantial risk of forfeiture. That is, you could, you know, lose it if you get fired. Uh, and that's beyond the scope of today's conversation. But, you know, certainly if you are <clears throat> receiving equity compensation, you know, if you're getting options, you should be aware of whatever the 409A valuation is. And if you're receiving uh, restricted stock, that is stock that's subject to vesting, you know, you need to be paying attention to and thinking about 83B election among other things. Uh, do we need to be orbiting around the Bay Area to maximize our chance of seed funding? Nope. The world, you know, uh, there's been a lot of unfortunate things uh, in the pandemic, um, and it is still going on, and those things are very, very unfortunate and maybe getting, you know, seemingly getting worse again before they get better. Uh, in terms of raising capital and seed capital, uh, the world has become flatter. So as folks have figured out how to work from home and work for, you know, um, virtually, venture, you know, Bay Area investors investing in country, you know, companies all over the world, all over the US and vice versa. So you do not need to be in and around the orbit um, of the Bay Area to, to get venture investment. Let me look to see how we're doing on time here. Can you just use a discount and no cap? Absolutely. Um, you know, and that many times is a potentially a very good result for a company. Um, the reason for that is, as I mentioned before, if the company does really, really, really well uh, based off of that, that capital that comes in on the convertible note or safe, <coughs> then when those shares do convert, excuse me, when those convertible instruments do convert over into shares of preferred or common, depending upon how it's structured, uh, the founders and other employees are taking less dilution. Um, so yes, you can just do a discount, you can just do a cap, or you can do a cap and a discount. Uh, somebody is asking about investment in pre-revenue startups. That's kind of the space that we're talking about here today. Um, someone's asking me to talk about a safe valuation cap. I believe that I talked about that. Um, I believe I also answered the shadow series question, which again, shadow series means nearly identical shares of preferred as to what the venture investor is getting, except for tweaks to basically the conversion price, right? Because again, uh, the liquidation preference and the dividend rate, again, because the conversion price of the convertible note or safe is going to be different than what the VC is paying, right? Because either the 
um, discount will be applied or the cap will be applied. Uh, there's a question about calculators for running pro forma cap tables. Um, the reality of it is, is that there's not really a simple go-to answer. And even there are, and I, um, there are some major providers out there in terms of cap table management, and I will not name them. Um, even they, you need to have somebody who's experienced reviewing those calculators because whether it's a safe or a convertible note, drilling into what that specific definition of fully diluted means is a common trap and pitfall because those will frequently be negotiated and changed. Now, even in a safe, I think they call it company capitalization as opposed to fully diluted capitalization. But um, that, as a result of that, you, you can't really just Google a calculator and then just input everything. That might give you kind of a rough estimate as to what the conversion will be, but it's not, it's not gonna be precise and guaranteed in your situation. So how does an exit work? Okay, so I think the question is here, a situation where there are convertible notes that are outstanding and then there's an exit for the company before the conversion of those convertible notes. And the answer, and what happens? What happens to convertible notes? Well, the answer is you got to read the convertible notes to see what those terms provide. Um, it's many of the convertible notes have um, a provision in there that deals with changes in control. So, you know, a merger or the sale of substantially all the assets of the company or, you know, some other change in control. So a sale of substantial, like basically 50% or more of the voting stock, which would trigger something, okay? That something is usually a cash payment of, it's usually some sort of cash payment. Maybe it's the outstanding balance of the note twice over, or maybe it's something else. Uh, but, or, or sometimes it is a conversion into common and then get treated as common. Um, so you got to read it and see what you got to look at the situation. You got to read what the note says. Um, but sometimes those things are not provided for, in which case that needs to get negotiated. That's also when it's really handy to have that majority of interest, the ability to do an amendment, the ability to have an amendment effected by the holders of majority of interest. Oh, great. Um, got a couple positive comments. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm just kind of reading through these. Um, there's a question about structuring preferred options for advisors and explaining the differences between LLCs, S corps and C corps and why Delaware. Um, I have a feeling this person probably missed the first part of the video. So just go back, well, you know, in a week or so when we send it out, check it out. We roll through why Delaware C corp is typical for a venture backed company. In terms of stock options, again, you need to get a 409A valuation done before issuing them. Those are not really very expensive anymore. They used to be pretty expensive, but they've really come down in price to a few thousand or so, assuming you've got a pretty early stage company. Um, and that's, you know, you know, and then usually in terms of how those get issued, there's usually like an advisor agreement that gets put in place and then a option grant agreement. And it's usually subject to vesting, sometimes single trigger, which is, they get terminated, <clears throat> they get all those shares accelerated. Sometimes it's double trigger, you know, terminated after a change of control, something like that. Um, yep, there's a question about incorporating outside of uh, Delaware. 
again, ch check out the um, early part of this video when it comes out, and I'll hopefully answer your question. Uh, what happens if the company does not raise a Series A? Great, 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 great question. Uh, well, I mean, uh, there are a couple of different ways it could not raise a Series A, right? It could not raise a Series A because it goes under, right? In which case, uh, it gets liquidated, you know, hopefully there's enough assets to satisfy the, you know, what the contractual provisions are in the save for the convertible note. If not, those folks are going to be out, um, could get restructured in bankruptcy. There are also other times, right? Like maybe the company's doing really well. Turns out actually that injection of $5 million enabled the company to, to grow and scale and it either became a lifestyle business or it just didn't need any additional capital injections. In which case, you got to look at the safes and convertible notes to see if there's a mechanism, right? So uh, convertible notes, you know, there's a maturity date. So the note could get called. You could maybe call the note. Sometimes also there is a mechanism where if the note has not, excuse me, if there hasn't been a funding, you know, whether it's a series A or prefer, you know, qualified financing, that's really what we're talking about. Not a series A, but a qualified financing. If that hasn't occurred before the maturity date, it'll convert over into common or sometimes even preferred, but uh, if there's no other preferred outstanding, it gets kind of tricky. Um, potentially at the election of the holder. Um, or if there's none of those mechanisms, sometimes they just kind of hang out there. And, uh, you know, the investors may not be super happy, but, you know, they're kind of stuck. So, um, you know, uh, that's, what, that's what can happen. Ah, does the founding team get preferred stock? And if not, how does their common stock hold up against it? So uh, 99% of the time, I'd say the founding team ends up, you know, gets common stock. In 2012, 2013, there was this push for the founding team to get you know, founders preferred, FF preferred, it's sometimes called. Um, that like disappeared, although I did see, or see it come back a little bit, uh, but it's it's really pretty uncommon. Um, and in part because I, I think it was hard for people to get comfortable on some of the tax implications of it. But that aside, the sort of second part of that question is like, how does that common stock hold up against the preferred? Well, you got to think about what the trajectory of these companies are, is supposed to be, right? There's supposed to be an exit. There's supposed to be maybe an IPO exit or um, uh, or an M and A exit. And you know, if the company is doing well, the goal is actually to get the preferred to convert over into the to you know to basically convert or be treated as if they were common in connection with the exit. So if the company is doing well, um, <clears throat> many times the you know basically the the common stock that the founders have end up ends up doing well if the company is not really doing quite as well as it had sort of hoped to or wanted to or and and or sold its investors on being then the preferred does sit ahead of the common in the preference stack and sometimes if you've got many levels of preferred you know there's a layer and those other levels of preferred are going to get paid out first so um again though in a, in a venture back company, the goal is to keep the, the common and the preferred aligned so long as everything is doing well, going well. Isn't the discount only applicable if lower than the cap? Um, again, the discount will be applicable because of the way the math works. The discount's going to be applicable if the pre money valuation is no more than a little bit greater than what the cap is. You know, you basically take the cap, divide it by, if it's a 20% discount, 0.8. And that's probably, I think, gonna set you up with what the threat, what the threshold is. Uh, I don't have my calculator really handy for that, but I think that's what it comes out to be. We've got, 
Uh, someone indicated that the SEC really dislikes safes and that we should avoid them. So the, the SEC has published at least one circular uh, or, or at least one notice that I've read indicating uh, that safes are not safe. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, in, in that sense, I guess you could say that they are, they, they don't like them. I think what they're what they concerned about is, uh, and this is just me speaking, it's not, you know, this whole thing is just me speaking, not, not, uh, not, not the firm's position. Um, but I think the concern is, because of the name safe, it makes it sound like it's a safe investment. And so, you know, safes are really designed for accredited investors only. Um, and again, you want smart money in there. Um, and I will say, we, safes are very common, very popular, and usually pretty company friendly. So we see them all the time, all the time, especially in the Bay Area. And, and these instruments are not you know, these are very risky investments, okay? So again, you, you want your investors going in eyes wide open. Last thing you want them to do, especially if it's like a friend or family, <clears throat> is to feel like you, you know, uh, suckered them into making some sort of investment. All right, well, I have more questions than I can answer, but our, our time is up. I wanna thank, um, each of you for coming, the attendees. It's been a wonderful, engaged audience. I want to thank Idea to IPO for organizing today's event. I want to thank my firm, KNL Gates LLP, um, for giving me the time and, and the sort of resources to put on today's event. If you've got additional questions, uh, please feel free to email me. I do keep office hours. Um, they're a little. Uh, um, hit or miss with the, you know, with, with the holiday, um, but I would be interested in having a conversation with you. Do not send me any confidential information. I do not want that. We're not engaged. I'm not gonna be able to give you specific legal advice. I can talk to you as I have today about some of the issues uh, that we see and how we might address it. Um, and my email address is jason.gordon at klgates.ll, klgates.com. Let me see, just make sure that I put that in here. Real quick, maybe not so quick. The mouse is not working. Yep. And uh, once again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, I hope you have a safe, uh, healthy new year. And I'll let you get back to building your great company. Take care. Bye bye.